On January the 29, 2019, Chicago police was called to investigate a reported hate crime against an actor, Jussie Smollett. They'll find Jussie with a rope around his neck, reporting an attack where he was punched in the face and unknown chemical substance was poured on him. The two supposed perpetrators made a reference to Make America Great Again campaign during the attack. Over 3,000 police hours later, it was uncovered the whole attack was a hoax. The question we need to attempt to answer today is how does somebody get to the point of staging a hate crime against themselves? Friends and associates, we have not done this for a while, and this case blew my little mind. It was literally that emoji of just your brain departing from your head. That was me researching this case. So, uh, we haven't done a gone bad in a while. Why? Why is that, Maya? Why have you been doing just deep dives, exhausting yourself? I had an intro for this. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it, friends. Listen. Let's see if I remember it. Uh, just roll the damn tape. Just roll the dumb tape. Maya is the name, Gone Bad is the game. Gone Bad is the series that I do on this very channel. I used to do it every Wednesday, now I do it every once in a while. What is the series about? During it, I sit on my fat ass and I tell you a story about a person that was living a regular life, like you and me, doing their 9 to 5, working, living, and then one day, boom, they just switch to crime. And we try to figure out what made them snap. Why? How does somebody just live a regular life and then one day they choose a criminal path? That didn't ring as well as the first time. It never will. It never will. But the subject of this day I had on my list of prospective cases, which by the way I have a form below or you can just put a comment and engage with the content about like anything that you want me to cover in the future. So I had this one on there for a while. And I'm gonna tell you why. Every now and then, every couple of months, I decide to cover the story on this channel that would usually fall under the entertainment kind of niche. Done Honey Boo Boo and Amber Heard and Johnny Depp before, so have really only covered two topics. However, I have realized after covering both of those that these stories usually bring a different type of audience. So just to make it clear if this is the first video that you have come across that you wanted to listen to something in depth on Justice Smollett's case, that's exactly what this is going to be. We are going to be covering his background, his childhood, his family life, and then his early career. Then we're going to be talking about the timeline preceding the attack and the aftermath of it, the trial and where this case stands now. So if you're looking for a cutesy little passage where somebody tells you a story of a potential hoax, flashes out a couple of text messages that you can see on TMZ, wraps that all up with a ribbon telling you police hours have been wasted and now somebody is facing charges. This isn't that. This case is horrifying. It should not have been treated as lightly as I have seen it being treated on the internet. So I'm going to do something that I haven't seen done before when watching videos on this case and just in general reading the articles and call for a trigger warning. If you yourself have ever been a victim of a hate crime attack or know somebody who has, who had actually gone through anything similar, or if you are triggered, sensitive to topics surrounding acid attacks, you know, if you have listened to my mini-sode on the podcast channel about it and found it quite sensitive, found that, you know, you get really emotional about the topic or have watched any single interview of an acid attack survivor and think, this just isn't for me, this just isn't something that I want to really sit in, I would suggest clicking out of this video or taking it in, you know, smaller chunks. Take care of yourself, like, because as I mentioned, I go into detail and this story, once you actually break it down in detail, is one of the more horrific cases that I have actually covered on this channel. Trigger warning aside, to figure out how we got here and to attempt to answer the question that I have set out to answer today, we have to talk about the background and see if there's anything in Jussie's past that could have indicated something like this would happen. So our story begins in Santa Rosa in California, when Jussie Smollett was born on 21st of June 1982. 
If I were to outline three things that shaped who Justice Smollett was at the time of the attack in 2019, it would be activism. He was extremely family-oriented and also creativity. So let us begin with activism, just for you to understand how rooted that was into this whole family. His parents actually met because of it, because they were both campaigning for civil rights. His mom, Janet, was in the movement with Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, who were the founders of the Black Panther Party. The party was founded in the wake of the assassination of a black nationalist Malcolm X, and after the police shot and killed an unarmed black teen, who was called Matthew Johnson. And the core of it was always to protect residents from police brutality. At the point where Jossie's parents would have met during those protests, the Black Panthers were already a Marxist revolutionary group. They would have spread through several major American cities and already had a membership exceeding 2,000 members. They established a 10-point program that called for an immediate end to police brutality, employment for African Americans, and land, housing, and justice for all. The Black Panthers were part of the larger Black Power movement, which we know later would translate more and more into Black Lives Matter, which was powerful during the Trump presidency, and it would emphasize Black pride, community control, and unification for civil rights. The fight for the civil rights would be rooted into Jussie's parents, and then they would be passing that on to their children and bringing them up in such a way where they should be activists themselves. But in the context of this story, I don't think that this is spoken about as much as somebody who has been sitting and researching on it for a week. So I would like to pass this on to people in the comments, like people watching this, who are actually a lot more into politics, a lot more versed in the Trump presidency and the movements that were happening on the side protesting against it in 2019. Because we are kind of omitting in this whole story what the core of it was, whether or not you think it was a hoax. Part of this story, part of this attack would be addressing Make America Great Again, which would be Trump's slogan. And I couldn't find online whether or not in the months preceding the attack there was something that would have triggered this. You know, if we are saying that this is a hoax, or again, if we are saying that this is a legitimate attack where two individuals decided to attack Jussie. I couldn't find that something would have, like, triggered that, so here is where I'm passing it on to you to see if you know if, you know, in the months of 2018, something like this would have happened. I think it was more... it was deeper than that, because Trump would have been president for over two years by that point. This was in the height when all of the organizations on the side would be fighting for Latinx community, people of color, just like on the side for their civil rights. And the effect of that on somebody who had this so rooted into them, I don't think it should be undermined. And I just haven't seen that connection online. So let me know what you think about that in the comments. But now let us move on to the family-oriented side, because this family was super close-knit. Janet and Joel decided to do the Kardashian thing before the Kardashians invented it, and every single one of Jossie's siblings had a name starting with a J. There was Jake, Jojo, Jackie, Jazz, and Journey. From what I gathered from their childhood, they would relocate a lot. They would move between states, between West Coast and East Coast, for as many as 13 times as the kids were growing up. The siblings would reveal in the interviews they would do as adults that their parents had very little during those days, but they would always get creative, and then that creativity would pass on to their children. When they would move into a new location and the parents would decide, okay, we are settling here for the next few months, the kids would say that they would even be building their own furniture with their own hands, from, like, the kitchen table to the slide in their bedroom to their beds. They would go to the lumberyard, get the wood, and then the whole family would work on their own little DIY projects. 
And when that wasn't happening, well, Jossie would later in the interviews say that him and the siblings were raised on a diet of classic films. As they would watch a Hollywood classic on a TV in their living room, after that they would just reenact it, because there was plenty of them. So this is something that they would do again as a family for fun. Jossie would say, you put on shows, we had a whole damn production, because we had all these kids. Creating was something that we just were expected to do. Soon enough, their moving between West and East Coast was all based off of their kids' careers. They started pursuing careers in modeling, acting, music. And during downtime, it was just another chance for the performance and family time. It would be Jossie's sister, Journey, that landed the first acting gig in the family. She was only 10 months old when she was first featured in a diaper commercial becoming the first Smollett to ever appear on camera. Journey's big break came when she was only four years old, playing the best friend of Michelle Tanner on Full House. The character here was written for a white girl, but her mom, Jeanette, still insisted the Journey auditioned, and it ended up in her having a recurring role. Out of all of the kids, Journey and Jossie would have the most prominent acting roles, and they would act for the first time together on a series called Underground, which is the show about a group of slaves who try to escape from the Georgia plantation. And here are people that worked with both Jossie and Journey, and especially with Journey on a non-profit that's called Artists for a New South Africa, would say that the siblings' sense of justice is very strong, and it permeates everything that they do. They're like a model sibling unit. They look out for each other all the time. And they all reach across and say, okay, I got my foot in this door here. Grab my hand, we are going in together. So by the early 90s, this was already a well-oiled operation. The mom would become their manager. Jazz became a successful child model. Jojo and Jossie would start off with the small movie roles. And Journey already got her recurring role on the sitcom Full House. So this is where Jossie would show his face on TV. He would also start off with the commercials, and then he would land his first movie role in the film The Mighty Ducks. Following the successful appearance on The Mighty Ducks, he was then seen in 1993 in the miniseries called Queen, where he was actually playing alongside Halle Berry, playing the role of Simon, the son of the protagonist of the series. Out of all of their early roles, the one that they probably collectively enjoyed the most was when they were actually all cast, all six siblings, were cast on their own ABC sitcom that was called On Our Own in 1994. This sitcom only lasted for one season, about 20 episodes, but the siblings would say that it was like heaven. Six dressing rooms were converted into one. We all were in the same school trailer. We would eat hot links and bagels for breakfast every morning. Very black and Jewish of all of us. So after one season, ABC cancels the shows. And Jossie would later say, you know, the producers were mainly white. But the kids just didn't mind. Like, they had fun while it lasted. And they were brought up to reject conflict. Jossie would say, we think it's a waste of time to fight and argue. All of the siblings would reunite for another show years later, in 2016, when they were given a Food Network series that they named Smollett Eats. It was a show celebrating their family's love of good food. Most of the children took different pathways as they were growing up. Jake and Jez took the design talent from their parents, the whole DIY situation, and monetized on it. Jake and Jazz teamed up for a Clio TV series that is called Living by Design with Jake and Jazz. From what I gathered, it's one of those transformative shows where, you know, somebody goes into a home of the homeowners that have applied for it, they refurbish it, they remodel it, but here the spin is that Jake, who is a really good cook, also cooks for them, while Jazz is mostly in charge of remodeling the house. Jake was also the resident chef on The Rachel Ray Show, and Jackie, the youngest of all of them, who was also the former child actor, now works as a data analyst manager. 
We touched upon the two topics now, the family dynamics and the creativity of all of the siblings, which leaves us with activism. And just as they were child actors, just as they were thrown into this industry, as they were very little, as they were only a couple of months, a couple of years old, the same will really apply to them and their involvement in activist movements. According to Journey, she was only five years old and she joined her mom at her first protest. Later, in the interviews, she would say that she was on the street holding a sign when the LA cops who beat Rodney King were acquitted on assault charges. She would also say that she was allowed to see the film Malcolm X when it was in the cinemas, and that her mom would cover the children's eyes in certain parts, but she didn't want to shield them from their history. Just like the rest of the Smollett siblings, Jussie would be inspired by his parents to commit to activism since a very early age. However, he was also personally affected, because he had lost somebody on the set, one of his co-actors, when he was only 10 years old. And this person died due to HIV. So, as a young boy, this has, of course, influenced him, and he started learning about the incident and tried to spread awareness about HIV, about homophobia and racism. In turn, at the age of 16, Jussie would start volunteering at the Black AIDS Institute. He also worked closely with the New South Africa organization and the artists like Carlos Santana, Latoya Jackson and Samuel L. Jackson. He wouldn't publicly come out from all of my accounts until 2015, when he was a guest on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, and also when he was featured on a major TV series called Empire. But from my resources, he came out to his family when he was 19 years old. So all of the siblings at this point were raised in this orbit of Black Panthers, later giving voices to the Black Lives Matter movement. And their pathway went from child stars to successful adults in their own creative industries. And it was born from their family, the connection to them, their influence, and also the history of activism. What this means in the context of this story today is that usually when somebody is really passionate about something, it seeps from their personal life to their work life. And that is what's going to be the core of this story. In an interview that I'm going to play later on, Jossie would say he was sometimes maybe considered even too outspoken. And that whichever way you cut it, whichever way you see this story, will provide the potential motive. But in our timeline today, before we get into the timeline prior to the attack, we have to speak about the criminal charge. Justice Smollett, as the court records would later be unsealed, would be revealed to have a misdemeanor charge from the year 2007. What happened was that in California, on September the 22nd, 2007, Jossie was stopped by a police officer, and he was caught driving without a license. So, when the police officer stopped him, then, you know, asked him why doesn't he have license on him, and asked him for his name, Jossie gave this police officer the name of his brother, Jake. The police officer stopped him because they suspected that he was driving under the influence, and Jussie would actually even sign a false name on the promise to this police officer that he is going to appear in court. So he signed his brother's name for the record. Jussie would appear in court here, he would get charges for false impersonation, driving under the influence, and driving without a valid license. To all three charges, he would plead no contest, and he would be given alcohol education and treatment program to complete, kind of like probation, and he completed the terms of this sentence by May of 2008. But I find this extremely insightful. I find that it finally gives us the in to Justice Smollett's mind. Because why give your brother's name? People really brush past this charge. A lot of people don't even know that this had happened and that this is the way it had happened. But to me, in the context of this story, it shows impulsivity. It shows just like thinking, 
on his feet, making a split decision and then not backing out of it. Because again, in that conversation, he could have just said like, listen, I slipped up, I gave you my brother's name. He didn't have to sign it on the record because what was the thought process? That either he is not going to have to appear in court, that the police officer will never figure it out, or, you know, I just wonder, did he ever have a conversation with his brother about this? Like, how is this explained then to the rest of the siblings? Like, what is the conversation that you have? Because either you have to appear in court, have the charges against you for false impersonation, or what? Did you think that your brother is going to, like, take your place and be like, oh, yeah, it was me? I just find it so interesting because I think it shows the pattern of just impulsivity, making an impulsive decision, but then following through with it. Following this charge and in the years prior to the attack, Jussie was becoming an established actor. His performance in 2012 rom-com movie called The Skinny, where he played a homosexual medical student, would receive great reviews. But then Empire fans rejoice because this role of Jamal Lyon came through his family. Jazz sent him the casting notice, and then his sister Journey, who once auditioned for one of the show's creators called Lee Daniels, the main guy behind the Empire, would help Jussie prepare. So the whole story behind the Empire, behind the Lyon family, was actually based off of Lee Daniels' relationship with his own dad who would always disapprove of his sexuality. So he wanted the main character, Reed Jossie, who played Jamal on the show, to take this responsibility, to take it seriously, playing an openly gay character who is, you know, coming out to his dad after basically being oppressed for years, after his dad always treated him like he's just not good enough. That would be the main underlining topic of the show, which as a premise was about the family's fight for control over music and entertainment company that they named Empire Entertainment. I'd love to know if any of you were Empire fans. I adored this show. It came out in 2015. I, as a fake fan, have watched about, like, I think three seasons, but truly this show had it all. It was making music that was a lot better than commercial music at the time. I still have a ton of those songs in my playlist, you know, in the like songs on Spotify. Cookie Taraji owned that role. Cookie's one-liners throughout those seasons were everything. The guest stars on this show and just the topics surrounding them, like the underlining topics they would bring to it. My favorite always had to be when Alicia Keys was on it, just music-wise, but also the fact that, you know, it showed us, like, sexuality is fluid. It's not just all about him coming out to his dad. Like, it really developed on that whole plot. Not to mention the then unproblematic King Hakim, who was played by Brashear Gray. I'm saying then unproblematic because I googled the guy and he has domestic violence charges. He apparently attempted to strangle his wife. I was like, why, why can we not have shit? I really wanted to sit here and give you 100% unproblematic king title. And I can't have that. Why am I saying he's unproblematic king? Because he was the king of that show. Like, while these charges was happening, he was still making music without using derogatory slurs, without the need to make music calling women, you know, whores and like all of that. Like, the music was pretty clean and still was epic, was stopping all of the charts. And speaking of music, regardless of the charges, regardless of everything, my comfort song and comfort video to watch would always be Jamal coming out publicly with his dad observing at the white party when he is singing You're So Beautiful and changes the song to say When a Man Loves a Man. That still brings chills down my spine. Like, I come back to that song every few months and still it has the exact same effect that it had on me in 2015, 2016, when it was released. This story will never stop to pain me because Jussie's character on Empire, I feel, did so much, not just for people of color who would then see themselves being represented on TV in a main character role, but also because his character would do so much for people who are, maybe, 
brought up in the situation like him, under the oppressive father, coming out in a family where it was treated like something you should be ashamed of. His legacy could have been so strong and was already strong. He was already getting recognized for it through awards and also he was getting paid quite well. From different records, I, people could not agree on the actual quote here, from different records, from different sources, it's everything between 65k, $65,000, and $125,000 per episode. And now I did a bit of math because more sources state that it was beyond $100,000 per episode. Every Empire season had about 18 episodes, which means that per season, Jussie would get paid over $2 million. He was recognized for this role beyond the monetary compensation. He would get nominated for a ton of awards, and then in 2016, he won his first award at the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. That night, he also took home other awards for the Outstanding Duo, Group, or Collaboration, and Outstanding New Artist. His single, You're So Beautiful, also won the Outstanding Song Award. And then in 2017, he won the award under the category of Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for his portrayal of Jamal Lyon in Empire. So, at the time of this attack, Jossie Smollett was at the height of his career. Everything, every single indication from how strong his bond with his family was, from his activism and how outspoken he was, his creativity, you know, the way that he was pushing himself, that he was singing now, performing, acting, and really thriving in that, showed for a promising career that could only go uphill. Except it won't. In January of 2019, Jussie would be living in Chicago while he was filming Empire. So this is where one of the locations would be. I don't think this was his permanent location. Again, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but he had a flat there. And here, on January the 22nd, he would report to the police that he received a threatening letter. It was sent to the Fox Studios, where Empire is filmed, and the letter contained threatening language. I'll put it on the screen because it contains the F slur. And also, it seemed to be laced with a powdery substance. The investigators would later think that it was crushed up Tylenol, so it wasn't anything that would, I don't know, react to the skin. But this letter, as you can see, it seems like somebody had cut out words and letters from a newspapers, and then there is a little hangman figure and seemingly a gun pointed at a person that is hanging. The letter that you are seeing on screen that Jossie received on that day will either be a real threat by somebody who wants to do him harm, it might have been a trigger. Again, a real letter that somebody had sent that had sent Jossie over the edge, or as will later be suggested by the prosecution, it might have been staged, just like everything else in this story. But after the attack we are going to be talking about now, the police would get a search warrant to search the perpetrator's flat. And here is where the detective will find several stamps that appeared to match the style of the stamps that were used on that hate letter. They also found the TV show script, their inventory would also log the magazines and the pieces of paper or writing. So let us speak about whose flat this would be and what their connection is to the case. Here I introduce you to the Osundairo brothers, Abimbola, who was 28 at the time, and his older brother, Olabinjo. I will be referring to them because in the court records and the screenshots that I will be showing in the case as Bon and Ola. So, the brothers were Nigerian, but they were born and raised in Chicago. They would, during their upbringing, participate in football, track and field, soccer and wrestling, before joining the football team at Kinsey University in Illinois. 
At the time of the attack, both of them were aspiring actors. They graduated from Kinsey College in Southern Illinois and then have returned home in order to pursue different roles in the network series and films that were shot in Chicago. The brothers would also have a criminal record, so this would be a few years before they would meet Jossie on The Empire, as Jossie was playing the role on The Skinny, I believe, in 2012. Ola would plead guilty in 2012 to aggravated battery, so he was actually charged with attempted murder in a stabbing that occurred in 2011, and this stabbing happened less than a block from the home that the police would raid in Smollett's investigation. He would only get probation and have to pay about $670 fine, and his brother, Bon, had a DUI charge from 2015. Where the gap in this research lies, and I would love if somebody knew the information to fill me in on, is whether Jossie was aware of these charges. Because if he was, it just adds yet another layer of sinister to how this case was actually a lot more premeditated than a lot of people who just have read a single article on it online believe. The brothers dabbled in other businesses apart from acting on the side. They started a party and decoration business in 2015, and here they operated on the south side buildings that was owned by their parents. This business, however, wasn't making much money, so at the time of the filing, it went into administration, it was dissolved. Court records would show that they filed for bankruptcy in 2016, and that they were tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, and their store was operating at a loss. However, in 2017, Ola would co-found a home remodeling company, and on this website, he said he had three degrees, including a master's degree in business and a bachelor's degree in management. At the time of this attack, what this would mean was that neither of the brothers would have a full-time job. Their monthly incomes, according to multiple articles, would be about 100 to 200 pounds that they earned through their various jobs, meaning that they were in dire need for some money. So they started combining the two other passions that they had. The fact that they were already in fitness, they were already in these sports, and they were already going to the gym regularly, and also they started getting smaller acting roles. The trainer at the gym in Lakeview, where the brothers would be doing bodybuilding and boxing, would say that these two were among the most polite guests in the two years he's known them. That they have never shown anything other than being good human beings. Apart from working on themselves, the brothers would also promote a fitness and diet program under the title Team Able. They have amassed over 20,000 Instagram followers, and more than 1,600 followers on Facebook. Things finally started looking up for them when, in 2016, they were signed with the Model and Talent Agency, and this would bring them some minor acting roles on Chicago PD, on different indie movies, and finally, on The Empire. So, Bon met Jossie on the Empire set as he was working as an extra. So, as I mentioned, every season of Empire would have guest stars. And in season two, they had Chris Rock. And Ola got a role to play the prison bodyguard for Chris Rock's character. He was just showing up in the prison scenes, you know, roughening up a fellow inmate. Ola, as you could see in this scene, is just an extra. He is literally in the background while the focus is on Cookie, on Taraji Hansen, and he has no lines and also doesn't share any screen time with Jussie. So the brothers would actually be brought to Jussie's attention when Bon would be introduced to him by the head of security on the set. And you can see how this would be beneficial for the brothers, who so far have been trying to make it in this career, to get introduced to the actual star of the show. Bon would say during the trial that it helped him because it allowed him to be around the acting scene and learn how they do things. This introduction in 2017 would lead Bon and Jossie to become mates. Jossie even managed to get Bon a role as the stand-in for the actor that played his love interest on the show. 
So I know in 2017, like Josie was supposed to be married on the show, as in Jamal was supposed to have a husband. I didn't notice that they were switching characters, so I'm not really sure how that went. But basically, he got him a role that is beyond just being an extra. And we will know that the brothers knew Jossie. He had their numbers in his phone, their text messages between 2017 and 2019, between the attack, their pictures of them in different clubs, their pictures of them partying. So we know that there was some sort of relationship between Jossie and the Sundairo brothers. Now, what is debatable here is exactly what kind of relationship he had with each brother. According to Jossie's testimony at trial, Bon and him weren't just friends on the set. He would testify that Bon would help Jossie get drugs, including coke, but also that there was some sort of sexual relationship between the two of them. According to the articles online, he would tell the jurors that Bon and him would sneak away from his brother Ola after the three of them were at the female strip club together. He testified that him and Bon would go into a private room, would make out a little bit, and masturbate together. During his testimony, Bon would deny this. He would say that he was not aware that there was even any sexual tension between the two of them. I'll put the texts up that I came across during this research between Bon and Jossie. Most of them that I have seen, I wouldn't say that they were in any form of relationship, that they were agreeing to meet on the side. Could it have happened? Yes. But most of the texts are about just Jossie getting drugs, them joking about how he's the Pablo Escobar in this bitch, and that's about that. The relationship between Jossie and Ola was kind of strange. Jossie would testify that this is somebody that he wasn't friends with. When asked by the defense attorney, what does he mean? Can he elaborate on that? Jossie said that he couldn't trust him. He knew he couldn't. That Ola kind of creeped him out. Every time that they were around him, that he didn't speak to Jossie. Every time we needed to leave, he made it seem like we needed to sneak off. He then proceeded to testify that this didn't seem like an issue. Like, he just wasn't feeling him. It's fine. Who is he to me? It's fine. Why this is relevant is, if you remember, Ola is the one that has a previous criminal record for aggravated battery. And also, the defense would really crawl to his social media pages in order to find anything even remotely homophobic. And apparently, they found some posts from his past that he has made on his Instagram and also via text messages to friends that the defense would claim were homophobic. If I manage to find them, I'll put them online. I didn't during the initial research, just this article about what was going on in the trial. But Ola would deny that he was homophobic. He wouldn't make these statements today because he just knows that this isn't something you should do. He also testified that he worked as a bouncer in Chicago's gay nightlife district, and also that he had appeared with his brother on a float during the 2015 gay pride parade. Basically, that this is the defamation of character that the defense is trying to use to prove any sort of homophobia, because Jossie at this point was openly gay. So far, as you can see what the narrative is going to be in court here that the defense team will be driving, is that Jossie had some sort of relationship with Bon and that Ola was creeping him out. So they would have to sneak off when they would go out in order for the two of them to make up. Now, as somebody who has actually read the court documents, let me give you a bigger picture. The implications of these claims if Jossie is lying. Bon always claimed to be straight, and he was dating a woman at the time. He said he never engaged in sexual acts with Jossie. And same-sex sexual activity is illegal in Nigeria. It can actually lead to 14 years in jail. And if the accused is married, the punishment can be death by stoning. And Bon and Ola would go to Nigeria often. They had a relationship with their family there. So even just the broadcasted statements here would have endangered both lives of them and their Nigerian family. Do I personally believe that these brothers were victims in this case? No. And I will point out down the line exactly why. 
but that this could have had graver consequences than what it did, the brothers losing their jobs, their talent agency deal, their names always being associated with this case. If anybody was to Google them now, these are the first articles that they see. There could have been. There could have been much graver consequences. And I just yet again wonder, did Jossie just bring another impulsive decision, followed through with it, or did he ever even have this in the back of his head, that they were Nigerian? How this is going to be seen if it comes to light in their family, in their culture? Did he ever even think this through? Or was this the narrative that the defense team had given to them? Like, what was the actual, real relationship between him and the two brothers? Back to what we know for sure. What will be proven in court, mostly through Venmo transactions, was that Jossie was using mostly Bond to supply him with drugs, whether it was weed, Molly, or Whitney, which is slang for cocaine. The Venmo reference of these transactions would usually come under something legitimate. So there is a reference from 2018 where Smollett was accused of purchasing ecstasy from the brothers and the payment was listed as training. Put a pin in that as well because there aren't so much events in Jossie's background that could have indicated something like this would have happened, but there are patterns that then in the future, once you actually hear the timeline of events and how everything was executed, make you double take and think like, oh yeah, this does sound like Jossie. This does sound like the way he talks, the way he acts. This does sound like a pattern that we have seen before. In trial, Jossie will try to portray that this use of drugs happened because the pressure of fame was too much. So he was using drugs as the coping mechanism. And his defense team would establish a narrative that it wouldn't be unusual for Jossie and Bond to just hang out in Jossie's car, smoke weed together, and just drive around town. And that this would happen because, of course, Jossie was a star on a TV show that was airing there in the city where he was shooting it, so he didn't want to be approached by the fans. He didn't want the fans to basically know that, you know, he's kind of like smoking weed on the side and didn't want to be interrupted. This was his downtime. In Jossie's narrative of events now, he is close to Bond, the two of them are spending some time together, you know, whether or not they're hooking up, we at least know that they're spending some time in his car, just smoking weed, doing drugs. And this is when it occurs to Jossie, these two boys are ripped. Why don't I use one of them as my personal trainer? Jossie would ask Bond to help him get in shape for an upcoming music video, something that was supposed to be an all-male version of Beyonce's single ladies and that he will pay him $3,500 for it, so for the training session and nutrition plans. If you believe that this attack is a hoax, that this is premeditated, this was just a cover for what is to happen, well, then you can see why the brothers were into fitness, that was their whole lifestyle up until this point, they were ripped, Jossie was a star on this show, and people in this position who are earning 100,000k per episode can pay any amount of money, can cash out on personal trainers. And this would be the narrative that his defense team is going to drive at trial. They would show Jossie's former payments to personal trainers, with him stating that in the entertainment industry it's normal to shell out thousands of dollars on private fitness. That would be supported by the brothers' social media pages. Team Able, where they would develop diet plans and fitness plans for people, doing fitness routines and stunts on their social media. At trial, Jossie would say, basically, I turned to him and said, you should be my trainer. He agreed. I took my shirt off and showed him my belly. He, Bon, told me about a herbal steroid that was illegal here, but he could get it in Nigeria. This is when Jossie said he paid Bon $3,500 because he asked for the payment up front. The brothers were supposed to be going to Nigeria around the time this attack had happened. He would testify that in the past he paid $5,000 for other trainers for similar services, 
telling the jury it was not unusual for actors to pay that much for personal trainers. And the defense attorney to that asked him, is your face important to you? To which Jossie responds, very important. I'm not a character actor. In the context that Jossie had just portrayed, the text messages that you are seeing on the screen now just ring truth. There's a grocery list, there's Bon asking Jossie about how many times he eats a day, does he have any allergies, you know, sort of to make a training plan for them, when is the music video shoot, there's a Google document that supposedly contains meal plan and a breakdown of nutrients that Jossie should be taking. There's on the surface nothing odd about this text exchange. What is a bit suspicious is that these messages began from the records I could find online on January the 20th, which would be nine days prior to the alleged attack. And you have to wonder, you have to ask yourself in the back of your head, Jossie was a star on this show from 2015. He was always the main character, he was always the person that would have the most amount of screen time, and he knew the brothers since 2017. He parted with them, he used them as drug suppliers. Why not ask them before? Why only ask them on January the 20th? could be pure coincidence, and again, as I'm saying, there are plenty of people, probably, that will see this text exchange and say, well, that's completely normal, you know, they would have phone calls with one another, so that's why there's no response in some of them, it's just nothing suspicious going on here. So going back in real time, there's this text exchange on the 20th, 22nd, Jossie receives that letter. The production team at Fox Studios offered Jossie security. Brett Mahoney, who produced Empire, would testify in court that they called Jossie as soon as that hate mail was sent to the set, that they were upset about it, and that the law enforcement was contacted and the letter was turned over to authorities. He would say that Jossie agreed to edit on set security, but he didn't want any, like, personal bodyguard, he didn't want anybody following him home, because he felt it would be too intrusive. After that conversation that Jossie had with the producer, he confided in Bon. He said, like, oh my god, it's so annoying, you know, now I'm gonna have this extra added security, like, I hate it, I don't want somebody to just be following me around. To which Bon apparently responded, you should just let me be your security. Jossie would testify that this would be now a running team. Like, it kind of sounded like a running joke at first, but it seemed like they were serious, that the brothers were suggesting, or rather Bon was suggesting, that Jossie should employ them as his personal security guards, like, beyond the set. He said that Bon started asking him more about the need for security. Around lunchtime, I would smoke my blunt, drive around the neighborhood of the studios. I don't want to be in someone's car. Jossie would say. I don't need to be driven around like I miss Daisy. He would admit to driving around in his car with Bon, but there was never, according to Jossie, any discussion of planning a staged hate attack. When asked, did you talk to him about some hoax? Jossie said no. And when asked, did you give him check as payment for some silly hoax? Jossie said never. What we have so far, based off of the narrative that Jossie would drive a trial, is that the brothers knew him. There was definite connection that could not be denied. So, a pattern had to be established, where Jossie is spending time with both brothers, but really more Bon in his car, as Bon is just bringing him drugs and they're just smoking some weed, driving around in his Mercedes. Another piece of evidence that Jossie would know that the police would eventually uncover would have been the check for $3,500, so there was an explanation for that. It is for personal training purposes. And then, of course, the only way to explain how the items for the attack and possibly for the fake hoax letter as well were found in the Osundairo's brother's flat the items that the police will know were used in the attack would be that the brothers attacked him on their own accord. Now, what would be the possible motivation for something like that? 
blackmail because the brothers so desperately wanted to get paid more, to milk him for some more money. You know, this personal training thing wasn't enough, so they desperately wanted to be his security guards. They saw the opportunity with that hoax letter to extort the star of the show. That is why we have Jossie repeatedly saying that after he got that hoax letter, the brothers would pester him to hire them as security guards. He would actually say that the brothers would be stating that he should hire them for a security job that pays $5,000 a week. And then when he was just saying, you know, I don't want to do that, well, the brothers wanted Jossie to be so scared that he would hire them as their guard. On the stand, the brothers would be faced with those allegations and also the allegations that they told Jossie that they would go away for 2.9 million that they have denied from day one and there are no proofs. Like, there's just no proof, no receipt, kind of like we have when it comes to the check, all of the messages, etc. So, there's just no proof, just allegations by Jossie and his team and the brothers have always denied them. The brothers would testify in court that after he received a hate mail at the TV studio, Jussie got the idea to fake the attack and blame it on racism and homophobia in order to create publicity for himself. They would say that he approached them, paying them $3,500 in order to fake the hate crime that he directed them to do it where a security camera would record it, outside the TV studio. The crime would involve a noose that would be put around Jossie's neck. Some sort of chemical substance had to be used. They started off thinking they should be using gasoline, but then they changed it to bleach. And of course, some sort of physical force had to be involved. Some bruises had to be inflicted, but they had to be careful. Injuries couldn't be severe enough to prevent Jossie from appearing in public eye, driving the narrative that this was a hate crime. Going back into our timeline on the days preceding the attack, if my resources are correct, the police has never determined who was behind that letter. I'm not sure whether that means there was never, like, DNA on it, you know, any fingerprints, because as we know from the raid to the brother's house, they found some indicators that they might have actually been behind it. So, on the saga of the letter, I see this happening in three different ways. So, there are three possibilities for me here. Let me know if I have missed out on something, if you see something else, and also pause to let me know in the comments which one do you find the most plausible. So, the first one, and this is the one that I find confusing, and the one that I leaned towards first, is that the letter was the trigger. Why I was leaning to that one first is based off of the brothers' testimonies in court. So, the brothers would always say that, you know, the letter arrived, Jossie wasn't happy about how the production team had dealt with it, and it is because of that, in order to make a statement, that he has decided to fake a crime against himself and to use the brothers to do it. If that is correct, what fits into that information is everything that happens between the 22nd of January and the night of the attack, which is the 29th. It is the check, because during that time, the check would be paid to the brothers, the amount of text messages and calls that were circulated between them. But what doesn't fit in that narrative are the text messages that I have shown you before. The whole meal plan, diet plan. Because if that was set into motion earlier, that would have to include that receipt of the letter. The second option also includes the third party sending that letter, and then the brothers seeing their in, seeing the way for them to benefit out of this situation, whether it is to blackmail him to try to extort money out of Jussie, or, you know, after that, failed, to figure out the way to threaten him, so that he does believe that he needs a bodyguard and he 
in turn pays them. So in this version of events, this is Jossie's version of events, it is that purely the brothers are the perpetrators and Jossie doesn't have anything to do with it. And then there is the way that many people will agree with, and that is that every single part of this story, including the letter, is staged and is all coming from the mind of Jossie Smollett. And in this version of events in particular, but in all three, we have that aspect of the studio wasn't taking it seriously, and that's why something had to be done. So I ask of you, what do you see here would have been an appropriate reaction? How would the studio have taken this seriously? As in, what had to have happened here, in Joss's mind, in his opinion, in order for that attack not to have taken place. If you look at it from that perspective, that is partially the narrative that both the prosecution and defense are driving at from different angles. The prosecution saying this was a publicity stunt, that he was not taken seriously, you know, that this kind of hoax letter hasn't been taken appropriately by the production team, and then the brothers stating that, again, that has been the motivation for Jossie to actually hire them in order to make that kind of statement. But, again, when you ask yourself what would have had to happen for this attack not to take place, if this is a hoax, if he could have stopped for about a week that he had in between the attack and the letter, what had to have happened? What would the production studio have done? What would the brothers have had to do? What if they have just rejected him flatly and said, no, we cannot be bought, we are not gonna be paid $3,500? And when you ask yourself that question, I think that the answer is nothing. He had the means, he had the opportunity, and he saw the bigger picture here. A statement had to be made about how hate crime is portrayed in the US. And for that statement to be effective, it had to contain that letter as part of its storyline. As we go along in our timeline, here there is no question of who committed this crime. They will connect this to the brothers because of the raid of their house and all of the items that they will find. They will be CCTV footage of them buying those items, taking a cab to the location. And that is something that is really pertinent here. The location. This was a random intersection in Chicago. It was happening on Tuesday morning at around 2 a.m. So the prosecution and their narrative in trial would always be if Jossie had not told these brothers in advance that he would be at this random place at 2 a.m., would they have any way to know that he would be there at that time? And the prosecution would agree that they would not. The question here would always be why. Why did the brothers not just tell him to F off? Why would the brothers accept to do something like this when there was always a possibility of them being discovered, regardless of how careful they were, regardless of this whole cover-up of a diet plan that they have established for it? They would say in trial that they felt indebted to Jussie. He got one of them born a stand-in role on Empire. And they also thought he could further help them with their acting career. And then, if you remember, the two of them have filed for bankruptcy only a few years before. They were really in a dire need for any money. So, of course, if somebody conjures this up in their head, tells them that there's no chances of them ever getting caught, you might just submit to it. You might just want to do it because you see all of these benefits, whether it is monetary gain or also the gain and progression in your career to this. After the letter, we have a couple of more texts and calls between Jossie and Bon. And then on the morning of January the 29th, Jossie texts Bon asking him when he's going to be leaving for his upcoming trip to Nigeria with Ola to which Bon responds that they are scheduled to fly out on the evening of January the 29th. This, if you are believing that this is a hoax, that this is a faked crime, means that Jussie knew 
that the brothers are gonna be leaving for Nigeria. So he knew they had this trip planned up. If they fake this right, if there's even CCTV footage of two figures in pitch darkness in the middle of the night, they will be wearing ski masks as well, they are gone. Nobody's going to suspect these two individuals that are at this point out of the country. So he is safe and they are safe in return. Once Bond confirms the date and the time of this trip, Jassy texts him back. Might need your help on the low. Are you around to meet up and talk face to face? The GPS records and also the video footage would then show that on that same day, on the 25th, Jassy drove Bon from the Empire Studio to Bon's flat. According to the brothers in trial, this is going to be the trip where Jassy is going to complain about how the production team handled that letter that he has received and how he wanted to stage an attack where Bon is to appear to be bettering him. The CCTV footage would show that at around 5 p.m., they would reach the apartment where Bon was then living with his brother. And this is where Ola would come out of the flat and they would be spending some time inside of Jossie's car. And this is, according to the brothers, where Jossie would ask if Ola can be trusted. Once this trustworthiness was established, if you remember, Ola and Jossie were never mates, they would not really exchange text messages. According to Jossie, Ola creeped him out. But here is where he would trust both of them enough to give them an in on a fake racist and homophobic attack. It would be there inside of Jossie's car on January the 25th where he would ask the brothers to attack him. The initial plan was for the attack to happen near Jossie's flat in Streeterville on January the 28th. I'm making sure to emphasize the date here once again, because even if you don't think that the whole meal plan, you know, the whole grocery list and everything before this was premeditated, was part of this hoax, there were still at least four days here where one party or the other could have backed out, but they didn't. They would agree to have a dry run on the 27th. And then Jossie was supposed to go to New York and then fly back on the night of the 28th. So on the surface, again, this is a great plan. I mean, I kind of even understand why some people wouldn't even buy that this is a hoax. Because, you know, he is flying for work, he is returning home, and then he returns late. He just wants to go out and get some food, because this is going to be the story of the evening. And on the other hand, these two brothers are flying to Nigeria on the next day, so why would they be committing a hate crime attack at this random location the night of, just like before their flight? Why aren't they like packing, doing anything else apart from that? And that why is also why so many people believe that this is a hoax, because this was a random location that it seems like somebody would have agreed upon and would have driven around making sure that there's just enough cameras to confirm that this had happened, but that don't picture the attack in full. Inside of that car, it would be agreed that the brothers should approach him on the street. And then, you know, if the cameras are capturing it, it has to seem like they have just caught his attention. So here, and I wish that this was incorrect because this part will never, ever make sense to me. But according to all of my sources, this is where Jassy actually told them to call him the slurs that he will later say that they have called him. So they are apparently going to call him Empire f -slur, Empire Ansler. Why do they have to say it? You know, if you are agreeing on this whole fake crime with somebody, surely you can just tell them, you know, later when I'm, you know, on TV doing the publicity stunt on this, I'm just going to say you have called me this slur. You don't have to vocalize it. You don't have to actually say it. Unless, and here is where the background of Smollett comes into play, this is, again, for him to act out for the camera, for him to actually feel the anger, you know, feel the rage, to act as if he was provoked. 
Or, for all we know, it might be just as illogical as his DUI charge, where he gave his brother's name, and we just never have an explanation for it. It just doesn't really make sense. But this, according to multiple sources, was agreed upon, that they are actually going to utter the slurs at him. The plan would be finalized on the 27th, where Jussie would pick both brothers up again at their residence, and then there would be GPS records, CCTV footage of them driving around the area where the attack would take place on the 29th. As they were just driving on the New Street and North Water Street, Jussie would be pointing to the CCTV cameras and explain to the brothers that they believe that those cameras would capture that incident. Here is where they would agree that Jussie had to be beaten up, but not too badly, and that they would have to give him the chance, because again, this is all done for the cameras, for the CCTV footage, for Jussie to appear to be fighting back. In terms of items that they are to buy, Jussie would give them about $100, for them to buy rope, rather this would be clothesline that they will buy, then some sort of chemical substance, liquid. From some sources, I could see that first they thought gasoline, but then they decided on bleach. They were also to buy balaclavas, ski masks, whatever they find to conceal their faces. If possible, red MAGA hats, make America great again, hats, and like any clothing, anything else that they might need for that attack. Here is where Jossie would confirm the time with them, because as mentioned, the attack was supposed to happen on the 28th at 10 p.m., and he would tell them to leave their phones at home, in order for, obviously, them not to be tracked later if anybody was to even look. It would also be during that conversation, on the 27th, during the dry run, where Jussie will give them the check for $3,500 that would be made payable to Bond. The reference, the memo line on the check would state, five-week nutrition workout program, and then in brackets, don't go, which would be the name of the supposed music video that Jussie was to make. And here is all the information that I needed. Not even because of the physical check that we have available online, but why my opinion that the letter might have even been a trigger, you know, that maybe this was not part of the plan, has shifted, where, in my opinion, every single bit of this case is part of a plan to fake a hate crime that will never, ever make sense to me, comes with this check is because why? Why would have the brothers worked for free between at least the 20th of January and here, the 27th? So for a week, they have actually already prepared the nutrition plan. They have sent him a Google document. They have inquired about his diet and everything. What, without payment? The check didn't come before the plan? It just doesn't really make sense, does it? For somebody who is a fan of Viola Davis, for somebody who has probably watched How to Get Away with Murder, Jussie, you're not thinking. You're simply not really thinking logically. He then flies out to New York, leaving the brothers to buy supplies on the 28th. And according to the court records, we have the Times, when the brothers would go to the shop, we have the CCTV footage here, where they're buying balaclavas, gloves, even the shopkeeper would be interviewed later. And they said that the brothers would be remembered by them because they, in particular, sought out these items, as if not all of the shops sell them and the brothers seem to just walk in and ask for, like, ski masks and MAGA hats. And then they would go across the street to do the laundry, out of which, according to the court records, one of them comes out, goes to another shop in order to buy the clothesline. Bank records would show that throughout that day, they would also deposit that check into both of their accounts. So they would split the amount and transfer $1,750 to each other's accounts. During the evening of the 28th, there would be multiple calls recorded between the brothers and Jussie, and it was said that the point of this calls was for Jussie to indicate that his flight is delayed, 
And then there was a call at around 1 a.m. on January the 29th where Jassi told them he had landed, you know, he's on the way to his flat where they were supposed to move the attack now to around 2 a.m. Because everything from this point on is so grim, I'm going to play the only thing that provided me joy during this whole research. And that is the most pointless interview ever done with the shopkeeper from that shop where the brothers have bought supplies. And why it provided me joy? I don't know. Let's see if you can figure it out. I'm, I'm amazed. I, 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 I've heard about it, read about it, seen it on the news, but I never thought that I would actually be involved in what they was uh, plotting and planning. Now that you know what you know, what you're hearing, does some of what you're in Counter with them involved makes sense a bit? It does. It does. To commit a crime, you would think necessary. You would want a mask like this to cover your face. You would want uh, a red hat so you can put pendant on somebody. So, yeah, it, it makes sense now. Is it the fact that Bow Wow was used in order to promote Durag in the background of this interview? Yes. Good job. You know me. We immediate best friends. Now let us continue with how grim the rest of this story really is. In terms of how this will unravel, in court this will be presented as breakdown of premeditation by the prosecution. So January the 22nd, Jossie receives that letter, he shows it to the brothers. January the 25th, he asks them to meet on the law, and this is where Jossie would say this was in reference to him getting the herbal supplement from Nigeria because the brothers are traveling there. But the brothers would say that this would be so that they can plan the fake attack. Jossie also wouldn't be able to tell them the name of the drug, any research that he had done on it. He just had no receipts on this whatsoever. January the 27th, there will be a dry run of the attack where the brothers would finally get their payment and then everything would be set in motion. After this, the 28th, they buy all of the supplies and they divide the money between themselves. We can also see that there were text messages on the 28th between them and I at first thought this might be code, that this might be them communicating that the flight is delayed, but judging that this was in the early afternoon, I would say that this is probably just them trying to stick to that cover story of training and how long Jossie has actually trained during his trip, how long was his cardio workout. At around 12.29 a.m., Ola calls Jossie. And this was about 19 minutes after Jossie's plane landed in Chicago and only a few minutes before Ola ordered an Uber that was to then take them to that same block where crime would take place. The brothers would jump into this Uber that would take them to 14,000 block of North Wells, where they flagged down a cab that then took them within three blocks of the agreed-upon location. They would arrive to that block at 1.22 a.m. And now, if they have left the phones behind, that would be why they have flagged that second vehicle. And also why they might be just walking the streets, trying to actually find Jossie. Because now, if they were to make a call, that would look again incriminating as hell, even if they had phones on him. But if they listened to him, they left those behind. While they're walking those streets, the video evidence would show that Jossie returned to his Streeterville apartment at around 1.30 a.m. At around 1.45, he left his building in order to walk to the nearby subway. He will say in the interview later that we are going to listen to that he was hungry. It was 2 in the morning. He went out to get eggs. You know, the brother suggested a lot of protein, you know, for him to lose his belly. So he was looking for Walmart, but Walmart ended up being closed, so he was looking to anything that is open, that is also providing some healthy diet, and Subway popped into his head. The next footage that we would have of the brothers would be at around 2.01 a.m. And this would be from what I believe is a department store. It's just footage of two figures running down the street. To put this into perspective, the brothers were dropped off at 1.22 a.m. They are just a couple of streets from the scene of the crime. They're walking in Chicago cold in January. 
probably concealing all of the items that they are to use, you know, like a bottle of bleach that they will put in a hot sauce bottle, clothesline, ski masks, possibly MAGA hats. They don't have any phones on them, so they have to find and locate on the street the victim of their crime. Let's say the crime took at least a couple of minutes to take place, and then they're seen fleeing the scene after 2 a.m. Let's give it 30 minutes, where they're trying to find Jossie on the streets. There were 30 minutes here where these brothers could have changed their mind. They have been waiting for at least 30 minutes to commit a fake hate crime. 